if you come to church every week, and if it's a church that's guided by the lectionary, what that means is most Sundays there'll be a psalm, an Old and a New Testament or Gospel lesson that's assigned for that Sunday. In one of the quirks of the common lectionary that the Catholic, Episcopal, and Presbyterian churches use is that the passage I'm about to read doesn't appear in the lectionary. So you could come to church every Sunday over three-year cycles and never actually hear Jesus teach you how to pray the Lord's Prayer. So we're going to cover that omission today. But let's first begin with the word of prayer. Let us pray. Gracious God, once more draw near to us that we may find our way to you. Bless this time and the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts that they may be an offering acceptable to you. For you are, as always, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. All right, so this reading comes from Matthew chapter 6. Now, Matthew 6 is right in the middle of the Sermon of the Mount series. So there's about three chapters of material that Jesus offers. Early in Matthew 6, Jesus offers some words correcting less than perfect prayer practices. And then he gets down to the heart of it in these verses. These are verses 7 through 13. And Jesus says, When you are praying, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do, for they think that they will be heard because of their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask him. And then pray in this way. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And do not bring us to the time of trial, but rescue us from the evil one. For each of us and those in particular need of prayer right now, to God be the glory. Amen. All right. Imagine that words had weight. Imagine that every word you spoke actually had weight to it and had to be carried around somehow. The more words that are spoken, the heavier the weight you carry. Now, you may start with a handful or two of these words, but soon, over the course of the day, you'll be stuffing them into your pockets and purses, and you'll literally be, be burdened by these weighty words, like the Christmas carol ghost of Jacob Marley walking around beneath his heavy chains. Now, this may sound like a ridiculous concept, because all of us toss off thousands of words every day. But if we think about it, words do have weight. Some words weigh heavy on our hearts, like rocks in our pockets. And no matter what childhood nursery rhymes may say, some words do hurt, like sticks and stones. Words can fill us with anxiety, with self-doubt. It can make us feel less than or make us feel helpless. So does that ring true for you? I hope so, because I've just spent about a hundred words getting this idea across. Now, I started thinking about all this while I was recently reading the newspaper, or in this case, scrolling through it on my phone. And it seemed like every news story that I read was bad news. The headlines, in particular, are all about the war in Ukraine. And all the stories about that war call to mind some of the worst moments that we last saw in the previous century. Stories about tanks and soldiers rolling across Europe, about missiles destroying homes and hospitals, about misinformation campaigns talking about imaginary American chemical weapons plants. Seeing then images of women and children fleeing their homes and literally of millions of refugees forced to leave their land because of one dictator's bruised ego. 
And all of these stories were like heavy words that filled up our pockets and our hearts and weigh us down with every news update. Now, if you read farther, it seems like you still only get more bad news about the economic cost of the war, about inflation and rising gas prices. You read about a movement to take away a woman's right to choose the best medical care and the needs for her own body. You read about Texas parents who possibly could face criminal charges for helping their non-binary transgender children live into their fullest God-given identity. And on top of all that, there's still this lingering weight and uncertainty around COVID, about mask mandates and changing regulations and really what the whole next few months are going to look like. All of this news, all of these words, it can feel like they're too much to bear, too much to carry around. And we find ourselves praying that somehow these words might just go away. Lori Santos is a Yale psychology instructor who's become known as, quote, the happiness professor. She offers a course called Psychology and the Good Life, and it's proven to be one of the most popular classes offered on the Yale campus. And she's a sought-after speaker because lots of folks are wondering, how could I possibly be happy in these troubled times? Now, Santos is quick to tell people that it takes intentionality to be happy. She says, first, you have to recognize that your minds are going to lie to you all the time. Our minds intuitively tell us that if we simply have more stuff, more gadgets, updated phones, more money, more time to veg out in front of cable TV, that suddenly with all of that we'll be happier. But the data clearly shows that those things don't make us happier. We are happier when we don't pick up the phone to mindlessly scroll through Instagram, but when we actually use the phone to call a friend and to talk to them. We are happier not by channel surfing from the couch, but by getting off the couch to actually exercise or work out or just frankly to take a walk outside. And then secondly, Santos acknowledges that there's actually a growing body of evidence that affirms that religious people are by and large happier. They have a greater sense of satisfaction in their life. But she says what's interesting is that this sense of happiness for people of faith has less to do with what you actually believe about Jesus Christ and more to do with how you act on those beliefs. That it comes from the act of coming to church, of being in worship, of helping at a spaghetti benefit supper or charity event, of working with kids, of taking time to meditate. Those things are what actually make us happier. Now, it needs to be named, that's a big reason why the last two years have felt a bit like a spiritual desert for all of us. Because COVID has kept us from doing the very things that brings us joy. It's in many ways kept us from coming together physically, from doing those faith events and charity opportunities that feed our souls and help us carry the weight of the world. Now, all of that brings me back to the topic of words. Words that weigh us down versus words that lift our spirits. Jesus addresses all this when he teaches his disciples about prayer. Now remember when we read in Matthew chapter 6, Jesus begins by saying, don't heap up empty phrases when you pray. It's not a question of whoever prays the most gets the most. Prayer doesn't work like that, I can assure you. Jesus instead offers a short prayer, a little prayer, what we've called the Lord's Prayer. But before we look at this prayer in more detail, I want to offer a visual device that may help when you pray the Lord's Prayer. 
And for this visual device, we need the help of a wise abbot who lived in the 6th century CE, a man named Dorotheus of Gaza. Now, Dorotheus is recognized as a saint in both the Roman Catholic and the Orthodox traditions. He led a monastery around 540 CE and is best known for sharing his Christian wisdom through very simple, straightforward teachings. One of his best known lessons asks us to imagine a wheel, so picture like a wagon wheel in which God is the center and the spokes or the radii that move out are the different ways that human beings live in the world. Dorothea says, when you wish to come closer to God, you walk towards the center of the circle. And in so doing, you come closer to others who are also moving in the same direction. The closer they come to one another, the closer together they come to God. All right, now go one step beyond St. Dorotheus. You're seated somewhere. You're seated in a pew. You're seated at home in a chair. You're seated at a table. But you feel distracted. You feel burdened by the words of the world. And so you choose in that moment to pause and to offer a prayer. In that moment, imagine pushing all the weighty words away from you. Imagine creating an empty space in front of you. And then imagine Dorotheus's wheel with God in the center of it. Now that's a healthy reminder. You are not the center. You are not the center of the wheel. You may not even be particularly close to the center of the wheel. But you can see it. You can focus on it. And so through your prayer, you are literally moving towards the center. So in that moment, the question becomes, all right, what should I say? What prayer should I offer? And so Jesus suggests, start with the words he taught us. Now remember the encouragement Jesus gave just before he taught the Lord's Prayer. The last thing he said in verse 8 was, God knows what you need before you ask. And so you take that to heart. And then you focus on that wheel's center and you begin, Our Father who art in heaven, our Father, our Mother, our God, our Creator, the one who is beside me yet who far exceeds me, the one who is beyond my knowledge yet who fully knows me, to you I offer my prayer. Then the next part of the Lord's Prayer are three thou statements. Hallowed be thy name. Hallowed be thy name. This is both a description and a call to action. Holy is your name, O God, worthy of all reverence and honor, and your holy name calls me to honor you by obeying your commands, by loving as I've been loved by you. Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as in heaven. See, suddenly there in the center of this wheel exists and unfolds before us the possibility of a totally different world order, a universe and a realm shaped by God. Not shaped by Caesar, not shaped by Vladimir Putin, not shaped by America or Russia or China, not first world or third world, not shaped by white, black, brown, or any other people and nations. It's a realm that comes from God that is a clear and present alternative to the larger realm. Karl Barth has reminded us to fold one's hands in prayer is the beginning of an uprising against the disorder of the world. Now, we focus on God. The initial three statements are thou statements, and then those are followed by three we petitions, we statements, first person plural. You know in this world, we are so dependent on first person singular, me, me, me. 
The corrected to that is we're given three statements that are all shaped around the subject, our. Give us this day our daily bread. Now, originally, these prayers were meant to be said at least three times a day. So imagine how that request for bread changes depending on the time of day it's spoken. In the morning, give us this day our bread, what is going to be needed for the challenges ahead. In the afternoon, give us this bread, give us the work, give us the strength to persevere in the heat of the day. And then in the evening, give us this day for the day to come, for tomorrow, and for all our tomorrows. If you remember Dorotheus's wheel, as we've been coming closer to God and move into the we part of the prayer, we are also drawing closer to others who are coming to God in the same way. And so this prayer is never, not just for the hunger in our stomachs, but for the hunger in all of our stomachs, for all God's children. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. All right, for all the lawyers, this is not a contract. First, forgive us our debts, and then we'll remember to forgive others. The two phrases are meant to be simultaneous. Forgive us our debts as we herewith forgive others. Those seeking forgiveness must also forgive. And then I personally like the word debts over the word sins because, frankly, we are all way too prone to be in denial about our own sins. We come up with lots of excuses. Well, it wasn't really a sin. It was just a mistake. I didn't mean to drive that fast on the highway. But we all fully know our debts. We know how much we owe the bank. We know what our student loans are. We know where we've fallen short of someone else's expectations. And the reality is we live in a world where money shapes most of our relationships. So we pray and imagine a world where debts are forgiven, where our worth has nothing to do with what we can produce or sell, where forgiveness and fresh starts mark every morning. Our daily bread, forgive us our debts, do not bring us to the time of trial, but rescue us from evil. This is real honesty here. Lord, we are so easily tempted. Help us to stay strong. Lord, we are so easily misled. Help us to stay on the right path. Be with us. And after these three we petitions, finally the prayer circles back to once more focusing on the center of the wheel with the doxology. Those last lines don't appear in Matthew's gospel. They don't appear in Luke's gospel. They probably were added by the early church almost a hundred years after Jesus himself taught the prayer. But it's right to have the doxology there at the end of the Lord's prayer because what we're doing is being drawn closer to the center of the wheel to focus once more on God to whom is all power, all glory, now and forever. Now, I could do a month's worth of sermons on the Lord's Prayer because there's a lot more that could be said about it. The Lord's Prayer is about much more than mere words. It's not long. It's not complicated. But if words ever had real weight to them, then these words are worth their weight in gold. Like spokes on a wheel, we pray to draw closer to God and in that action become closer to one another. In this prayer, in this act, we find the secret of happiness. We find the literal meaning of life we find our greatest hope and our greatest strength, and we find peace in anxious times. So during this season of Lent, push back the weighty words, create a space, and in that space, breathe, and then offer this short prayer taught to us by Christ. 
for truly it is much more than mere words. Thanks be to God. Amen.